Imagine for a few moments that it's the Saturday before Halloween. Since Halloween Day is typically not recognized as a paid holiday, the Saturday before is typically when all folks too old for trick-or-treating go out. They dress up, they attend parties, and they visit attractions. On this Saturday, before the spookiest night of the year, you're going out with your friends to one of the best party spot neighborhoods in your city. Except this year, it's the first year after the COVID restrictions have finally been lifted. Masks are no longer required, and people are no longer required to social distance. It was the first night since 2019 where everyone was free to celebrate their own way yet again. And because of this hype, because of this anticipation, thousands more people show up than previous years. So many people, in fact, that you find you and your friends actually aren't free at all. In fact, you suddenly find yourself barely being able to move. And as you try to make your way through the crowd to go to your favorite bar, it becomes more and more cramped and people start to fall. The street is narrow. There's nowhere to fall to except on other people. Pretty soon, the spookiest night of the year becomes a literal nightmare. This is exactly what happened in the small neighborhood of Seoul, Korea on October 29, 2022. One of the worst crowd-crushing tragedies in recent years where almost 200 people were injured, but over 150 people lost their lives completely. And here is that story. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are talking about something that is fairly recent. It only happened a year ago, but I thought it would be an interesting topic for today's video to revisit. Now that it's been a full year, we can talk about what happened, how these things happen, how it's not the victim's fault, and how we can try to prevent these in the future. My name is Hannah. I do videos on all types of creepy and disturbing things. That's basically the only requirement for my videos. So if you also like that kind of thing, or you also share a morbid curiosity like I do, consider subscribing to the channel. And let's get right into today's story. Today, we're talking about the Seoul, Korea 2022 crowd crush tragedy. And before we get into the story itself, I'm going to give you a lay of the land. In Seoul, South Korea, many of you have probably heard of it. There's a neighborhood within Seoul called Itaewon. It is in the Yangon district. And please excuse my pronunciation of any of these Korean words. I do not speak Korean. In only recent times, though, this area of Seoul, Itaewon, has become extremely popular for the nightlife crowd. It has the best bars, the best restaurants, the best nightclubs. And it's become a very popular tourist destination as well, where both Koreans and Americans, as well as other foreigners, enjoy the nightlife there. So let's briefly discuss the culture. Years ago, Halloween was definitely not much of a thing in Korea. They generally didn't really celebrate it. Halloween has has only recently become more popular there where people now dress up and celebrate on this day or during this time of year and it only started to become more popular and celebrated around the year 2010 but if you're in Seoul and you're gonna celebrate Halloween Itiwan, that neighborhood we were talking about is the place you go that is where everybody goes Halloween is a huge part of the culture in that specific neighborhood that is where the biggest celebrations for Halloween take place. And if you want to dress up, you're going to go to that neighborhood. It is believed that this is due to the increased number of foreigners that live or visit Seoul in recent times, as well as the fact that there is a U.S. military base nearby. So because of all these things combined, some of the more Western culture and therefore Halloween, a more Western holiday, is now kind of leaked over into Itiwan. So that's the neighborhood of Itiwan. Itiwan itself, the layout of this neighborhood, the streets are very narrow. 
off of these streets are often alleyways, and the alleyways often have dead ends or lead into other narrow streets. On the night of this tragedy that we're talking about, there was also a temporary iron wall on one of these streets, making the street even more narrow. Now, this already sounds like a recipe for disaster, but in addition to this, Authorities in Itiwan were aware of the crowd issues in previous years before COVID happened. There had been crowding issues, but the authorities that were assigned to Itiwan that night were told to stick to petty crime, make sure there was no drug deals going on, make sure that nobody was stealing stuff from the shop, stuff like that. They were not focused on crowd control. And then with all of those factors on top of everything else, this was the first year in three years that people got to go out without the COVID restrictions. So people had gone out to celebrate in 2021, but there was a mask mandate as well as a social distancing mandate. The mandate was also extremely strict in 2021 because a COVID outbreak had been traced back to ET1 recently. So not only are these mandates in place, but also the authorities are threatening pretty harsh punishments for anybody who didn't comply with those. So this was the celebration in 2021. There was no issues with crowd control because of this social distancing and the very harsh rules that were in place. And also people were very motivated to follow them for fear of the consequences if they didn't. So as most of us are aware, the vaccines came out and we are now, I mean, even now living in what some people consider a post-COVID world. I would not consider this post-COVID, I would consider it more like COVID part two as outbreaks are continuing to happen. But last year was the first year. It had been about six months since people had been very steadily vaccinated. And so people were thinking they could get back to normal lives. Regardless, the restrictions were lifted last year. So in Halloween 2022, People were stir crazy. People had been inside for years not being able to celebrate with your friends. So when they were lifted in 2022, everybody, everybody in the area wanted to go to Itiwan. So on Saturday, October 29th, 2022, the Saturday before Halloween, over 100,000 people attended the Halloween festivities in Itiwan. Almost everybody and almost all the victims we're going to talk about today were in their late teens or early 20s. For those 100,000 people that show up to Itiwan to celebrate Halloween, 137 police officers were assigned to the neighborhood to work. And like I said, they were given instructions from their higher-ups to focus on crimes, not to focus on crowd control. But even if they were told to focus on crowd control, 137 officers for 100,000 people is a ridiculously small amount. For context, another part of Seoul that night had a protest planned, and there was about 25,000 people at the protest, a quarter of who showed up at ET1. And for that protest, authorities had assigned 6,500 police officers to help with crowd control. You may be thinking, okay, well, that's a protest. Things could go more wrong at protests. People can get more rowdy or passionate, so they probably assign more officers. Well, there was a BTS concert in Seoul earlier that month, and they still assigned 1,300 officers for that 55,000-person crowd. So just as you think there's already enough contributing factors to a potential disaster, things get worse. Like, just everything was set up for bad that night. The fact that authorities didn't see how catastrophic this was going to end up is baffling to many, especially, I mean, to all the victims' families to this day. They're baffled as to how authorities did not see this coming. And many crowd experts and other experts have determined that this was not only foreseeable, this should have been predictable, but it was also very much preventable. Early in the evening, the first call to emergency services, which is 112 in Korea, was at 6.34 p.m., hours before 
before the tragedy would occur. People in the area were exclaiming to authorities that there was simply too big of a crowd and not enough space. As many as 11 calls were made this early on and nothing was done. There was many warnings to authorities and the calls were being put as low priority. This makes this whole thing even more tragic because if those dispatchers had put these on higher priority and authorities actually took action at this time, this entire tragedy still could have been prevented. Like they didn't do the proper crowd control and preparation before the event, they could have at least seen that things were not going well and it was 6.30 in the evening, hours before anyone would lose their lives. So that first emergency call was at 6.34 p.m. Between then and 10 p.m., it's estimated that there was at least 79 calls made to 112. So it was right after 10 p.m. that night where everything actually occurred. Many experts that have analyzed this event said that the crowd crush started at 10.08. Some people say it started at 10.15. Either way, it was after 10 o'clock, shortly after 10 o'clock. So overcrowding is already bad, but then the businesses in the neighborhood start closing their doors for the night. They are closing down. So all those people that were in those places are pushed into the street. So the overcrowding becomes even worse. Not only that, but then because those businesses are locked, there was nowhere safe for people to escape to either if they were able to get out. It is likely that this is why things went from bad to worse when all the businesses started closing and people were even more tightly put together in this alleyway. Some of these emergency calls we were talking about were literally people, not only people warning about the crush, but literally people in the crush, like begging for help, suffocating, actively suffocating and asking authorities to come help them and often it being too late. So many calls were coming in that phone and internet reception in this area of Seoul had disconnected completely. So the crowd crush is happening right now. I know for a lot of people that don't know a lot about these occurrences, it seems really confusing. Kind of like, how how does this happen? Like, yeah, that would be pretty claustrophobic, but how could you knock it out? People could just spread out more? Why aren't people at the ends just spreading out more? Why aren't people stuck like diving down into the crowd and crawling their way out? Can't you put your arms out and make a personal bubble? Well, the answer to that is simply no, not in a crowd like this. The way crowd collapses work when it's this thick is that when people start falling, there's only more people around them. And so people start to fall on top of each other. There's been famous examples of this. Most recently, many of you have probably already been thinking about this during this video, but the Astroworld concert tragedy on November 5th, 2021, 10 people died in that crowd and hundreds were injured. Or on February 20th, 2003, at the station nightclub in Rhode Island, a fire broke out and 100 people died in that tragedy. Yes, many died from the fire, but a lot of them were trapped inside of the nightclub because the exits were blocked because the crowd literally clogged the available exits and some of the other exits were locked up. 11 people died at a Who concert on December 3rd, 1979. This happens and it's terrifying. And because you're stuck, there's nothing you can do. For a crowd, two to four people per square meter is generally a safe amount. People can still move freely and move move where they want to in that amount of people. It's when you get to either six to eight people per square meter that things start to get dangerous. That is when people can no longer move freely on their own and when crowds become fluid is often how they're described. Nobody has their own free will anymore. The crowd is moving like a wave and almost nobody has control. This is the best diagram of this phenomenon I could find. Thank you to The Guardian for this illustration. But that is important to note because it's important to not blame the victims in this situation. There is this myth that people in a crowd like this they feel claustrophobic, they panic, and it creates a stampede. People start being like every man for themselves, and they panic, and then that panic turns them into pushing 
others out of their way, just shoving people against walls and doing anything they can to get out. Other people's safety be damned. And that is simply not true. Like I said, it's fluid. People don't have control over it. People are generally pretty calm in the crowd until the crush starts happening. Do not be fooled by this narrative as often authorities use this narrative, this stampede narrative to push the blame on the crowd and make it seem like the crowd did something wrong. People shouldn't have panicked or have gone in the first place and that it was their fault that this happened. Usually it's a way to shift the blame on the crowd and make it seem like it wasn't their fault for not anticipating the crowd, doing better crowd control, and assigning more officers to the site. As the Guardian article also said, quote, people don't die because they panic. They panic because they are dying. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about the science of crowd crushes, let's go back to Itiwan and what is happening a little after 10 o'clock on October 29th, 2022. People, of course, start pulling out their phones and start filming their surroundings. I can show you a few clips within this video, but I don't want to get too graphic just because I will get age restricted by YouTube for sure. YouTube does not like super graphic things. I can show you some examples so you can see what the crowd looked like, what was kind of happening, how this fluid thing was happening without showing you any of the injuries or anything like that. In the more graphic videos, there was evidence that people were falling on top of each other and people ended up in five to six layers of people lying on top of each other. As you can imagine, the people at the bottom layers are not going to be able to breathe properly. So interestingly enough, another misconception is that people often believe that most of these deaths happen from getting trampled, that it's like getting trampled to death. And yes, some people do get trampled to death, but the vast majority of the injuries and death were due to something called compression asphyxiation, which is exactly what it sounds like. People getting crushed either against the walls of the alleyway or getting crushed underneath other people, and then they die from lack of oxygen to the brain or simply their lungs can't expand. This is the best graphic I could find of the map of the crush. Total credit to the BBC for making this. As you could see, the crowd occurred near the Hamilton shopping mall and around 100,000 people were crammed into this particular area. This narrow alleyway, by the way, was also sloped. Here's a photo of the alleyway after the tragedy from another perspective. So as you can see, this alleyway being crammed with so many people in all directions, there was a domino effect. So somebody falls at the top and then it creates a domino effect and everybody falls down this slope on top of each other. And this causes the piles of people. And then, like I said, some were crushed against the walls and they had nowhere to escape to. People during this time are, of course, screaming, crying, panicking. And worst of all, they're just helpless. Even the people around them that are okay are helplessly watching their friends and strangers get crushed. And they're literally trying to pull them out from these piles and actually physically cannot do it. Three off-duty U.S. forces Korean soldiers were in the crowd and all three of them jumped up on ledges earlier on and were up on those ledges pulling people to safety. Again, contrary to popular belief that bystanders are panicking and it's all, all, you know, all men for themselves is just not true. Bystanders were actually trying the best they possibly could. Most people were trying to help other people and get others out of there. But there was nowhere to go. There are some videos of people like dancing in the streets or putting on makeup and seemingly not caring about the tragedy going on very close to them. But again, I'm not blaming those particular people for not being aware of what was going on. 
but unfortunately, it then hindered the ambulances from getting through the crowd. However, ambulances did come. 800 emergency personnel were deployed to the scene after the calls started coming in after 10 o'clock, and they were doing what they could, but so many people were stuck. It took hours to clear the scene. They didn't get to everybody until after midnight. There's video footage, which again, I can't show on here because it shows some of the victims, but there's police officers, paramedics, and even random bystanders just crouched down on the street performing CPR desperately on random unconscious people. For many people, though, it was too late. I mean, you could die within a few minutes from lack of oxygen, and pretty soon the street streets were now filled with bodies after the scene was more cleared and decongested. And so with these bodies, they have to start just like finding random jackets and blankets and clothes to cover them up until the paramedics could cover them up with actual proper blue blankets. By the end of all this, 109 women and 55 men died in the crowd crush. 157 total lives lost. Another person died, I believe, from their injuries on November 14th, a couple weeks afterwards. This raised the death toll to 158. But there was one last death victim, and Korea declared them the 159th victim of the tragedy. This is an anonymous victim, but it was a high school student who passed away, was a victim of Suicide on December 12, 2022. There's not a lot of details about this particular victim and what happened. I can only assume that since they declared this person a victim of the crush, they died from suicide from PTSD. Something happened in the crush. They saw something, as many of people did, see things that you can't unsee, and they could not take it. Almost 200 other people were injured, but they all thankfully survived the tragedy. But for those that were not physically injured or lost their lives, everybody else had pretty bad PTSD, as you can imagine. The pain, the suffering, the loss of life that they witnessed, probably even if you didn't see anything horrific, hearing screams probably did a number on your emotional and mental health. A lot of people felt guilty because they weren't aware of what was going on around them and felt like if they were, they could have done more to help. A lot of people felt just terrible guilt because their friends were with them, you know, survivor's guilt. They survived and their friend didn't and their friend got sucked into the crowd right in front of them. There was a girl who, again, remains fairly anonymous, but she was with her friend who was a victim of the tragedy and they were taking selfies up to minutes before it happened. And after the fact, her friend said that when they got in the wrong place, like the crowd literally swept them off their feet. They weren't even walking anymore. They got swept into the crowd and it was like they were floating. Their feet weren't even touching the ground. The crowd was that powerful. And again, she ended up surviving and her friend ended up passing away, showing some of the selfies that they took beforehand, as well as this poor victim's parents who are now forever scarred by this. And also just, I mean, sadly, but also not, you noticed I'm not showing pictures of many of the victims. And that is because as far as I'm aware, and as far as I could find, there is no complete list of victims of the 159 victims. There's not a list of all of their faces, let alone their names or anything like that. But that is actually by design. A lot of the parents and families of the victims did not want their names public. Many of the names were leaked online in spite of the fact that the family didn't want them leaked online, which is just horrible, absolutely horrible. And a lot of the families just wanted to stay private. I think because there is a lot of victim blaming that goes into stuff like this, like a lot of families feel shame about it happening, or they're just worried about retaliation from people around them. Other people online blaming them for letting their loved one go in the first place, blaming their loved one for being in the crowd at all, even though they had no control over it. 
stuff like that. Like that's it is just like the victim blaming that goes around. It is completely the family's prerogative if they don't want the victim's name out in the public. So of course we are not going to be sharing the victim's names. The ones that I am showing in this video have consented to news outlets to have the face of the victim shown. So the aftermath of this, it's still ongoing. And there are pretty intricate details about what's going on. But basically, there are some higher ups in the authority and government in South Korea that royally fucked up and are not being held accountable for it. We'll just put it that way. An investigation was opened. Many officials and lower level police officers were found at fault and arrested and charged a lot of the times for negligence, a couple of them for destroying evidence or trying to, you know, like hide some evidence to downplay any fault. A couple of police officers ended up also passing away from suicide for things uh, being involved in this incident or uh, feeling like they were at fault for some of this incident. The public and of course all the victim families are also just of course very outraged that this happened, that so many things that were preventable were ignored. There is alleged evidence that some of these authorities and agencies were having meetings before this happened and were aware that the crowds were going to be very, very thick and were aware that the crowds have been issues in the past. I kind of touched on this at the beginning and they still did nothing. Like I said, they were assigned to focus on petty crimes rather than crowd control. And then like we talked about as well, calls were coming in hours before there anything bad happen and still those calls were ignored. Nobody did anything at that point. So basically to make it look like something was done, a lot of the lower level officers involved were arrested and punished for this, but none of the higher ups, the police chief and the people higher up on the authority tree were never held accountable and it's been like concluded that they weren't at fault and no consequences for the people that should have been assigning more personnel to that area. And for reference, I will show you like crowd control is important and you can do stuff to prevent this. Here is a quick clip from the 2021 where all the restrictions were still in place and there's tons of officers controlling the crowd. They are keeping the mandates in place and they are making people keep moving, keeping people away from each other. And that is what should have been done in this case. There has been protests regarding this. And actually, like I said, this was only a year ago, so more stuff might still happen in the future. I do hope that the people that should have seen this coming are held accountable because I know mistakes happen. I know that there's human error in every type of job and official in the world. You know, there's like literally nobody perfect on the planet, but this seemed like pretty intentional negligence. This seemed like a, well, yeah, the crowd is going to be pretty dangerous, but we're just going to kind of hope that nothing bad happens because we're more worried about the protests going on over here. We're going to assign all the police officers to there. This just did seem, from what I understand about the incident, like pretty, pretty intentional negligence that they were just like, well, hope nothing bad happens. I think what gets me the most is that when there was evidence that it was not going well, even if they didn't think it was going to be that bad. When the calls started coming in, they should have been deploying people to that area ASAP to get the crowd under control. And it's just wild to me that people were calling 112 and saying, hey, this is a bad situation. People are already starting to get stuck. There are too many people and not enough pavement. And then on top of all that, the subway stations weren't closed down. Like this is also very close to a subway station where people were coming in off the subway. So not only is there not that much room, but then people keep coming into the area when there's already not enough room. Like, oh man, it was just one of those situations where literally everything, the entire deck was stacked against these people. And 
it so much could have been done. And I want to just caution people to not blame the people in this crowd. They were literally just going to have a fun night. They are not responsible for knowing that a crowd crush could occur. There are safety commissioners and police officers specifically for that. It's not their responsibility when they're just, you should be free to just go to a bar. And if there's a big crowd, the vast majority of people do not know that they're in danger. They're just going with the crowd. Like at a concert, it's like, whoa, people are pushy, but you're not, you don't feel like you're in danger and you shouldn't feel like you're in danger. So that was the Itaewon Seoul South Korea crowd crush of 2022. Let's prevent things like this from happening in the future. Again, if you get in one of these situations ever, it's not your fault for just living your life. However, it never hurts to be careful. If you see a crowd like that, it still doesn't hurt to call emergency numbers. The more people that call, the more likely they are to do something. I know in this situation, things were not done, but hopefully in another situation, authorities will take it more seriously, especially now that tragedies like this have happened. Call police, take your friends and family, whoever you're with, and get away from everybody. I just cannot believe how much lost young, young, young individual lives were taken that night. It's just such, so preventable. Okay, guys, that is going to be it for today. I know it was a really sad topic. Please like the video, not because you like the topic, but just to help the channel, just to help support me. It's the best free, simple, easy way to help the channel. And I will see you guys all in the next video. Thank you so much to all of the patrons seen on the screen right now with a special shout out to all of our top tiers. Colin Holmes, The Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Brittany Phillips, Momo Neon, Marita144, Sage K, Elderly Hipster, The Puppy Hag, Rebecca Jackson, Toby, Carter, Kawakan Anime and Gaming Convention, Sarah the Crazy Fish Lady, Maxi, Ellison Luna, Tiny Mighty Bookworm, A Bunny Apparently, Leon Vanek, Elliot Fink, I'm in Your Walls, Habromania, Cyberdog Investigations, LLC, C, Vicky Cat, Amy B, Tick Urch, Dead Without the E, Ball, Olivezilla, Chara, MH Dave, Ami, Lindsay R, Miss T, Lou Raccoon, Shanna R, El Magnifi Coco, Victor Schmiel, Laura Winter, Lilith, Dana, Ashes, Arsa Ghost, Goshzilla, Gabriella L, Arya Anomaly, Ghosty Girl, and our newest Mel Miller.